As the theme number 10, uh, we will uh, study time series econometrics. So time series is a very uh, large and important area within econometrics. Uh, so within this one theme, uh, we can uh, mainly scratch the surface, but uh, I want to give you some idea of uh, how the time series modeling uh, differs from the cross-sectional models. And this will also then pave the way towards the uh, panel data, which combines the time series and, uh, and cross-sectional elements. And uh, I will start with the um, with a general introduction to the time series, and we will also consider the so-called AR1 or first-order autoregressive process, which will be our main theoretical uh, uh, tool for for modeling uh, time series in this course. Okay. So first, as a motivation that why time series are uh, important, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of. Uh, uh, how where time series uh, emerge in different uh, types of applications. Uh, so very traditionally in uh, macroeconometrics, uh, uh, data come uh, in, in form of time series. If you think about, uh, let's say, gross domestic product of Finland, so GDP or inflation rate. Uh, so if you consider one country, we might have some uh, monthly data or quarterly data or or yearly data of the of the same country. Uh, then, of course, in finance and uh, and uh, other related areas that look at uh, financial markets. So we one might look at asset returns uh, or stock prices. Uh, so, for example, the stock market data are uh, typically come in the in the in the form of time series. Uh, and there, of course, the frequency of the of this uh, time period can be very high. So you might have a uh, even some uh, minute level data or or hourly data daily data and so on so this illustrates also that uh, that this uh, time interval can be can be very short like just one minute or or very long uh, up to one year so uh, then of course uh, in this uh, in this uh, emerging field of business analytics and uh, and uh, probably many of you are interested in that one there are of course uh, uh, we are interested in this kind of traditional financial market data or macroeconomic data, but then there are also also uh, new types of data. So very often this um, uh, term big data refers to not just the size of the data set, but also the new types of uh, um, new ways of obtaining the data, typically from uh, internet or social media or or. Uh, some kind of other other type of uh, measurements. So it's not only this uh, number of observations, uh, and uh, it's perhaps even more the situation number of variables is uh, increasing, but it's also this kind of uh, new forms of finding the data based on some some kind of um, monitoring uh, uh, and and typically also related to the to the internet. So anyway, time series uh, analysis uh, has been traditionally very big in econometrics and, uh, and with this uh, uh, availability of uh, new types of big data that also is likely to continue to be important in the future. So uh, first question, when we expand from the, from the previous, uh, previous themes, so how then time series actually differ if you want to use uh, some similar uh, regression models such as uh, multiple linear regression model, then, then what should we take into account? So as you may notice, I have also changed the font uh, for this, uh, this theme to indicate that this is slightly different from the setting that we have considered so far. So uh, we earlier thought about this um, um, in the cross-sectional setting, we uh, indicated observations with index uh, i that runs from 1 to n. And uh, in the cross-sectional setting, we think about this, uh, this n observations as a random sample from some population. In the, in the case of time series, we typically denote the observations with index t, t referring to the time, and then, and then the usual notation is that this t runs from 1 to capital T. So, um, uh, in this sense, uh, it's not necessarily a, a random sample from the population or this kind of random sampling. We need to think about it in a slightly different way. So typically we do observe all of the 
all of the events within this time window. However, the thinking is that uh, that the history might have evolved in a different way. So if you think about the um, about the stock market, for example, that uh, the price of the stock in the stock market uh, might have plausibly developed in a in a different way if there was not some kind of random shocks that influenced the the price uh, during this time time window. So you can think about as there would be alternative. Uh, histories or alternative time paths that uh, don't necessarily uh, realize. So we only observe one realized uh, time path uh, uh, among many, many alternatives. So we, we still think about this kind of observed time window as a, as a sample from some kind of uh, population of possible uh, plausible uh, developments that could have occurred, but only one, one this kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, time path actually uh, realized and we, we observed it. Another, another important distinction between cross sections and time series is this ordering. That uh, if you think about some uh, ordering of random sample, of course, you can order the, the uh, in many ways the cross section. So if you have a sample of firms, you could order them uh, based on their turnover from smallest to largest or based on their employment uh, or based on their hist uh, how many years they have operated uh, or so on and so on. So this is what I mean that uh, in the cross section, uh, uh, the ordering is not necessarily self-evident and also in the regression models, uh, the ordering didn't really make any difference. So we didn't pay any attention to the ordering so far. But if you think about the time series, then of course there is this kind of natural historical ordering. So these time periods occur in certain order. If we have a yearly data, then we can, we can of course, uh, uh, always uh, uh, rank our observations based on the year from smallest to largest. Uh, and in some sense, it's, uh, it's uh, usually natural to follow the chronological order in, uh, in the time series. And uh, Therefore, also this um, previous theme of autocorrelation that we slightly touched in the previous uh, theme, uh, it, it becomes now a bit more relevant because there can be such kind of path dependencies uh, or correlations between the adjacent time periods. So uh, what happened yesterday might, uh, might influence uh, uh, the, the value of the variable today and what happens today might influence the tomorrow. So this is what this term autocorrelation uh, means, really, and, and uh, there is also another another term, uh, serial correlation, even even more brings this uh, this uh, attention to this kind of uh, that we have a series or here time series. So these terms autocorrelation and serial correlation are more or less uh, synonymous. Okay. So what what if we then want to use this kind of time series data in the in the regression models that we have considered. So uh, here on this slide, I, I try to clarify the distinction between so-called static and uh, dynamic time series models. So let's think first about the static model. So this is just the single regression model that we have uh, already considered from the beginning. Uh, notice now that I have just substituted this index i by this index t. So now I'm thinking about this uh, y and x variables as time series rather than some cross-sectional observations. And now, of course, we could also then model the, the uh, autocorrelation. And, uh, and uh, when we talked about autocorrelation in the last theme, we meant autocorrelation. Uh, so, so we refer to the covariance uh, between this disturbance terms epsilon in different time periods. And to model the autocorrelation, then we need, of course, some kind of theoretical theoretical model. And for that purpose, we will use the so-called AR1 process. That refers to autoregressive uh, process. This AR comes from autoregression. Okay, we will come to that shortly. And uh, then we can also introduce some dependencies between uh, different time periods explicitly. So in the static model, this uh, dependence between different time periods comes implicitly through the error term. So if we assume that this uh, error term in period T is correlated with the error terms in other periods, but uh, in this uh, deterministic part of the regression equation, there's not really any 
any kind of dependence from other time periods except period T. But in the dynamic models, we can introduce some, uh, some dependencies and uh, we can, first of all, use so-called lacked explanatory variables, which means that we could introduce to the, to the single regression, we could extend it to the multiple regression case, but uh, introduce uh, not only the explanatory variable X in period T, but we could also have X, X variable in period T minus one. So this kind of lacked variable X T minus one would then, then allow for this kind of uh, um, delayed effects, for example, that, uh, that uh, something that uh, um, happened in the last year or last period in T minus one would also influence uh, Y in the in period T. Okay. Another possibility is to use this kind of time lags uh, uh, and introduce uh, directly this uh, variable Y in previous period. So Y in period T minus one as another exponentiary variable. And in that sense, I want to point out that this is also becomes this kind of autoregressive process. So notice here that the autoregression can be modeled uh, either through this epsilon term, as in the static model it's often done, or it can be done explicitly through this uh, uh, dependent variable y by introducing y in period t minus one as one of the explanatory variables on the right hand side of the equation. And I have in included now, or I have denoted the coefficient of this uh, y in period t minus one by, by coefficient gamma to, to distinguish it from these beta coefficients for the x variables. So uh, I will come to this uh, static and dynamic models in more detail in the next uh, video lesson, but I want to give a little bit more details and intuition about this autoregressive process, which is the full, uh, topic of this specific lecture. Okay. So, as I mentioned, this uh, autoregression can be built for this uh, error term epsilon, or it can be also for the for the for the y variable, which is the dependent variable. So, for the sake of generality, let's just think about this autoregressive process now in terms of them um, some generic random variable v. So, this v might be set to, to y, or it might be epsilon. So um, here. We talk about first order autoregressive process. Typically, it's abbreviated as AR1. And uh, we introduce this coefficient rho. So, this Greek alphabet rho is then referred to as autocorrelation coefficient. And uh, that indicates the uh, degree of dependency from this random variable V in the previous period, T minus 1, when the present period is T. And we assume in this AR1 process that uh, this uh, value of random variable V in period T is this rho times uh, V in period T minus one plus some uh, white noise, which is, uh, which is denoted by U and U in period T. And we assume that this U is another random variable, which is uh, uh, stationary. I come to the meaning of stationary a little bit later. Uh, it's not uh, autocorrelated and it has finite variance. So we assume assess essentially that expected value of u in every period is equal to zero. Then u in period t is not correlated with any other u in other periods. And uh, the variance of u is, uh, is uh, constant in all periods and it's finite. Okay. So in that sense, u is very similar to the, to the error term epsilon that we have used in the regression model. So this, this U in some sense satisfies all these uh, Gauss-Markov assumptions that we have introduced earlier. But now this random variable V is autocorrelated because of this, uh, this rho, unless this coefficient rho is equal to zero. So in the, in the materials of, uh, of uh, this uh, theme, I will introduce some uh, Excel files uh, which allow you to gain more intuition about this AR1 process with the, with the simulation. So I will only indicate you some examples of these uh, simulations. Uh, so this is uh, one uh, diagram that I have uh, generated with this Excel table. So again, this Excel table, Excel file will be available in, uh, in this uh, 
lecture materials of this team. So I have just simulated some, some AR1 process uh, with uh, 500 time periods. And uh, if you set this, uh, this coefficient rho, so rho was this autocorrelation coefficient. And if you set it equal to zero, then this random variable v is just pure white noise. So this is how white noise look like. So it's very important to first to gain understanding that, okay, if you talk about white noise, then how does it look like? So I have here plotted just, uh, just this kind of line diagram. So to, to, uh, to plot the development of this random variable v over this uh, five, 500 period. So in, in that sense, remember that this uh, time series, it has this kind of history. So we can, we can just plot the development over time. And as you can see, this kind of white noise, it is just, uh, just uh, um, completely random, of course. And it's, it's uh, changing the sign. So, so this uh, horizontal line indicates the level of zero. So, so we get both positive and negative values and uh, it's completely random. So, so uh, this um, process might change the sign from positive to negative or negative to positive, but it's just so completely randomly. Sometimes just for some, uh, some strike of luck, it is, uh, remains positive for multiple periods. It might stay negative for multiple periods, but there is not any kind of uh, systematic pattern in this kind of white noise process. So for sake of comparison, uh, please keep this uh, image of white noise in your mind. Uh, uh, and again, of course, you can experiment further with this, uh, this Excel files that are available in this, uh, this course materials. But let's compare this one then to the, to the situation where this autoregressive coefficient rho becomes positive. Uh, so in that uh, sense, keep this mi in mind this, uh, how the white noise look like. In the next slide, uh, we have then positive autocorrelation where this uh, rho is equal to uh, 0.8. So this value 0.8 is just arbitrary. This is just for, to illustrate you how uh, autocorrelation looks like compared to the white noise. So here again, this, uh, this uh, uh, random variable v is fluctuating uh, uh, from positive to negative. Uh, so it's always, always uh, uh, centered around this, uh, this zero value. So we have positive and negative values. But compared to this white noise process, then notice that when, uh, when this uh, variable v becomes positive, uh, then there is a tendency to that it also remains positive for, for several periods. Eventually it turns negative, and when it gets to the negative values, it also stays there uh, for, for many periods. So I, I now go back to this white noise process. So notice that in the case of white noise, this uh, uh, sign of this V is changed uh, much more frequently than when we have positive autocorrelation. So there tends to be then this kind of, that when when in the previous period we have a positive value of V, then because of this positive row, the next period is also going to be likely positive. So that kind of gives this kind of, um, kind of path dependency in this, uh, in this process. Uh, notice also that autoregressive process can also have negative autocorrelation. So if you have negative autocorrelation, then the situation would look something like this. So notice now that if we have negative autocorrelation, then uh, this process will change the sign very frequently. So for example, if we have a positive shock, uh, so if we have positive V, then in the next period, uh, we are very likely to get the negative value. So this is what the negative autocorrelation would, uh, would look like. So in the positive autocorrelation, this uh, shocks tend to be uh, keeping the same sign for multiple periods, whereas in negative autocorrelation, we tend to change the sign uh, immediately. This is what the negative autocorrelation would look like. Of course, we typically, uh, if, if we think about some time series, then, then something like this would be a more typical pattern that there is some kind of positive, uh, positive autocorrelation but for sake of completeness, I also want to indicate that negative autocorrelation is also possible, and this is how it would generally look like. So it's also, I want to mention that uh, while we will focus on the first order autoregressive process indicated by AR1, so in, in uh, theory, of course, we could also use uh, second order 
or higher order autoregressive processes. So this would mean that uh, we will not only take uh, the previous period t minus one, but we would also take uh, a period t minus two into account if we have AR2 process. In the general ARP process, we will have uh, t minus one, t minus two, and so on until t minus p. So we can have, of course, also more higher order autoregressive uh, processes, but uh, perhaps those already those um, uh, previous uh, simulated examples illustrated you that the first order autoregression is already quite rich, so it can can uh, uh, generate very very rich set of patterns with positive autocorrelation, negative autocorrelation. So for the purposes of our course, uh, the first order autoregressive process is uh, uh, quite enough. Just for sake of completeness, I wanted to to indicate that what the higher order autoregressive processes would look like. And also in the, in the uh, Excel files that are available, you can also experiment with the higher order uh, autoregression if, you, if you're interested. So, but coming back to this uh, AR1 process, a uh, couple of points to note in, in, in theory. So, um, why why I say that this AR1 process is already very, very rich uh, to, to generate many kinds of patterns. So one reason is that, uh, that uh, notice that this, uh, the role of this, uh, this uh, random variable U that is generating white noise. So we can think about it so that this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this AR1 part, so this row times V in period T minus one, so that characterizes this kind of path dependence in the in the process, where whereas each u t this u variables then then bring in some kind of uh, random shocks every every period, and uh, if you want to write out this this uh, v t in in more parts, so notice that of course uh, v in period t minus one is just uh, rho times v in period t minus two plus u minus one, so. Substituting this uh, v in period t minus one with the past periods, we can actually write out this uh, entire history of this uh, this uh, this uh, process. So ultimately, uh, this uh, this AR one process, uh, the new information comes only through this uh, variable u. Okay, so this v in period t can be written down as as uh, u in period t plus rho times u in period t minus one plus uh, rho to power two times u in period t minus two, and so on and so on, and all the way to the first period. Uh, uh, so, so then the first period is, is uh, uh, number one, and u in period one is, is then multiplied by rho to power t minus one. So all of these random, uh, random u are kept in this, in this uh, AR1 process. However, uh, when this, uh, uh, absolute value is rho, of rho is uh, less than one, then this uh, rho to power t minus one and rho to power three and so on, they become less than one. So they become smaller and smaller as the exponent of this rho coefficient become bigger. So in that sense, this, uh, these past shocks to you, they tend to die out in this kind of uh, uh, random process. I have also here indicated the, how the variance of the of this uh, random process uh, looks like. Uh, so it's possible to then show that when the absolute value of rho is uh, less than one, then the variance of the random variable v is is uh, finite. So we would need to take then this kind of uh, uh, sum of these uh, these uh, these variances. So. Notice that uh, that this uh, value of one is very critical for for the row. So we say that this process is uh, stationary if this autocorrelation coefficient rho is less than one or greater than minus one. But particularly the plus one is is very very interesting. So um, of course, then the natural question to ask is: Okay, now what happens then if the if this parameter rho is exactly equal to one? So this is actually called the situation, uh, uh, we call it unit root. And unit root is so important case that uh, we will devote um, 
separate lesson uh, in this theme for that. But notice that when, when, uh, when rho is equal to one, so then the model becomes uh, so that vt is equal to v imperial t minus one plus u. So then in fact, uh, this um, v just collects uh, the sum of all shocks in, in all periods. So this, uh, this uh, role of this row is to, in some sense, dampen these past, uh, uh, past uh, shocks. But when row is equal to one, then these shocks uh, you just keep accumulating. So in every period, this, uh, this uh, shock in period one, U, U1 is, is present and uh, it doesn't uh, decrease in the, over the past, uh, over the history. So as, as the time goes on, these past shocks uh, remain equally powerful as they were in the, in the first period. Whereas in contrast, if I go back to this case when we have a row is less than one or absolute value of row is less than one, then the shock impact of these past shocks tends to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so this is why in this, uh, these cases when we had, for example, in the simulation, this row was set equal to 0 0.8, so we had this kind of path dependence, but anyway, the impacts of any shocks would uh, eventually die out and uh, the positive shock would uh, turn to negative as, as new, new shocks become. Whereas in the case that we have unit root, this is not necessarily the case. So these kind of positive shocks will be present uh, forever and they will not uh, die out over the time. So in that case, when we have a unit root process, the situation might look something like this. So here uh, is also this uh, from this exactly the same Excel file. This is a simulated uh, um, AR1 process. Notice now that when we have a unit root case, uh, it's not no, no longer the situation that this uh, this uh, curve uh, is changing the sign from positive to negative. But in this example, it start to grow, and it's it's we get this kind of uh, growth process. And what this stationarity means is that. Uh, in the stationary process, uh, we always uh, fluctuate around this uh, uh, constant level. In the, in the simulation, it was zero. But now, in this case, this uh, process starts to drift away from the zero level, this horizontal line. So we, be, we get this kind of uh, stochastic growth. So, so that is kind of, uh, kind of very, very critical uh, distinction. If you have a unit root, if rho is equal to one, then uh, this uh, process can start to grow over time. Whereas if, uh, if rho is less than one, it's just fluctuating around the zero. So that kind of fluctuation around some constant level such as zero is called uh, stationary process. But when there is this kind of growth trend, uh, then, uh, then we have a, have a non-stationary process. And uh, in the AR1 model, this is, uh, this is this unit root is, is very critical to, to distinguish this, uh, this kind of uh, growth process. So you might also wonder, uh, what about if rho is even greater than one? So I have also, to illustrate that, I have indicated what happens if we set uh, uh, rho equal to 1.05. So notice that this, uh, this process just very quickly start to uh, expo explode to the infinity or or minus infinity. So, so it just grows so fast that it becomes, uh, becomes not meaningful. So this is why this case of uh, uh, rho exactly equal to one is, uh, is meaningful because it can generate this kind of, uh, uh, this is of course completely uh, random simulated synthetic trend, but, uh, but you, if, if you think about some kind of time series of the GDP of a country or, or some stock market data, if you look at the, how the price of some some stock has developed in the stock market, then then this kind of curve might might well uh, describe a situation like that. So in many many cases, the time series uh, which have some kind of growth growth trend like like GDP or or some stock prices, then uh, uh, AR one process with a, with a unit root can very well produce at least very very similar kinds of uh, random looking trends. So that's why this, uh, this unit root process uh, is very interesting way, uh, model for, for that type of time series. So this is just a, a kind of gentle introduction to the time series and having, having this kind of uh, 
theoretical model of AR1. So I will utilize this AR1 process later in, uh, in the context of the, of the regression models. And I will start the next uh, by extending the usual linear, linear regression model to this kind of static model with uh, autocorrelation. But I will also consider the dynamic model briefly. Okay, thanks for your attention and we'll continue in the next lesson.